So AKA was buried uh, and uh, a lot of people were talking about his grave site and everything. And it kind of brought me back into what kind of communication or what kind of message do you mostly hear when a person passes away? Now, also verses that might be helpful for you knowing how to communicate uh, to a friend who has had someone pass away. And I thought this was such an, it would be an interesting one to bring up to people and uh, to bring up to you guys also as well. So you may know how to navigate your conversations, speaking to someone who's just lost someone uh, very recently or in the past that they're struggling to actually think. Now that ex kind of explains the title uh, that you see in uh, down there, where is AKA now after the grief or after thing. Now we all know that this particular body that we have here is not forever. It becomes very clear at the harm that you can cause to this body. Uh, but apart from that, there are certain verses that will kind of help us navigate this particular subject. And one of the most popular or very, uh, high, the most read chapter that you, uh, you can tell me how much of it do they read, but it's mostly Psalms, 25, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. They read that a lot. And it's the tone of what the chapter is actually sending or the message that you hear in the chapter that they are trying to kind of allude to or why they use it okay and this is what it says and i'll illustrate further as to how people use this in relation to death the lord is my shepherd so where i am going from this present life to the next uh he is the one that is shepherd over that road now remember the idea of a shepherd implies follower because a uh, sheep is the best follower over a goat right so the lord is my shepherd and if you look if you think of the person who's writing this you have to think about the palestinian mentality or the middle eastern mentality if you look at videos of shepherds in these areas they actually walk in front they don't walk behind them they walk in front and the sheep follow them as they go on and so when he's making the parable about the lost sheep in the in the book of luke and he says he is the shepherd that will go after the one and leave the 99 uh, it shows you leaving these ones who are self-righteous to fetch the one who is out looking in order to make sure that he is in the right you would rather go after that one whether being lost or whatnot you you understand is that he leads the shepherd mostly is ahead of this thing unlike the one that's behind a shepherd is thought of so the lord is my shepherd now that also explains jesus being the first born of the dead and so that that kind of brings you that idea there that jesus is the one that so when we are saying that we are also alluding to the point of resurrection or the idea of resurrection and remember whether be an unbeliever or a believer all will be resurrected okay the believers will be resurrected towards the thousand year millennia that will spend with the messiah but the unbelievers will be resurrected after for judgment we've spoken that about that thing so there's a lot that we are saying when you read that he maketh me lie down in greener pastures that's in the present state uh, and he leads me beside the silent waters or the quiet waters you may put it so that's salvation okay he brings salvation the rest he's talking about here is not that uh, compared to i am d in distress and i find rest and so i am away from my troubles my whether it be depression or whatnot or what struggles you face with that's not what he's talking about those you might continue to have that doesn't mean one is not safe because he has that uh when he says so when he says he leads me to the still waters he's talking about place of salvation he convicts me and brings me to stillness a place of stillness or a place of quiet waters it's a relationship place with god he refreshes my soul and so there you go with that tone is that if i'm ever in distress in the present moment soul and all that entire jazz my uh, my well-being it's in him so that's such a, a very deep 
sense of communication right there. And then he goes on to say, he guides me along the right path. And so that's now the role of the Holy Spirit, right? And so you can see all of the Trinity in this entire chapter, as a matter of fact. He guides me between, uh, between the, the still waters. That's the place of salvation. That's the Messiah. He refreshes my soul. That's present. That's the Holy Spirit. And then also he guides me in the right path. That's the path of the Holy Spirit. That's the path that uh, he will lead me back to, to, to the Messiah, whether it be in conviction, in righteousness, or to repentance of my sin he brings me to the right path that's christ all right uh, it's not uh, that uh, it's not like gprs gps whatever you call it you know 10 left no I'm, i was going to look for a job god made me 10 left <laughs> that's not what he's talking about okay uh here what he's talking about the right path it's him right because remember i'm the way the truth and the life so that's that and in his name for his namesake so he does this so that i others will see god's testimony through my life even though i walk now this walking whether it be physical or what or the spiritual journey towards truth even though though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death present or in spiritual uh, I fear no evil. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't be scared. But because I know truth, I'm not presented with fear. Because I know the ultimate answer is that he is light in this darkness. The valley of darkness, basically. Uh, I will fear no evil. Evil might befall me. And in that moment, I might show fear. And I might have that thing. And you will remember that. This will kind of bring you back into your understanding of salvation from a past tense perspective to a present uh, uh, point perspective. We've spoken about that as well. So, uh, for he, for you, you are with me. So I will not fear no evil. For you are with me. What is that about? I am the way, the truth. So when I was making a point to that, you can see where you find it in that particular uh, verse right there. It's not that I'm not afraid. I may be afraid. That does not mean that I am all doomed, right? Uh, I fear no evil, meaning I know the truth at end. I know what it results to. It results to me being with the Messiah. So even when I die, I will result with the, with, to be with the Messiah. For, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, he's speaking about comfort, about correction. And so that's a very interesting thing. It implies one who is a disciple unto God, that he's, he's leading, guiding, correcting, and leading the path. Right? And then it goes on to say, he prepared the table in the presence of my enemies. I don't know who my enemies are. Is probably not talking about the physical one, because Ephesians chapter number 6 will actually explain that even further. Right? And so my enemies is not the person that's trying to kill me. My enemies is the devil who wants me doomed. The physical man's relationship it does not result to, to being the final or a fin into a final view of you being my enemy. No, you are just misled and misunderstood. Uh, you are confused. <laughs> I'm not your enemy. I don't know you like that. The devil is my enemy. Okay. So unfortunately, your agenda aligns with this. You are like your father there. You understand. You align with your father there. Now, notice when it goes further then, he says, and you anointed, you anointed my head and my cup overflows. Okay? So it's present state, joy, whatnot, the whole nine kajas. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Surely. So I understand something. Now I can conclude of what good will come after and we know that from jeremiah 29 i think uh, he does further that particular thought and all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever and ever now that's future okay i will dwell there's no doubt in this person's mind as he's writing this and so this is the thought line we ought to think about our life when we are on this life when we are here so where does one go after his thingy? He goes either to be with God or otherwise. But we, we know that 
there must have been something that was done back down here, meaning one must have declared uh, the innocence of the Messiah in presentation for his sin, that he might find rest in him. Right? The Bible speaks about people that have created a stumbling block by the rejection of the Messiah. When you reject the Messiah, Jesus Christ, you actually create a stumbling block for you not to find rest. There is no rest outside of him. So that's one of the verses that are very popular, by the way, for um, funerals. And you can see the language that he's using, present state and the future state. Present state and future state. Now, Psalms 27 as well tends to fall into this bracket. And you can hear how it starts. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And it doesn't mean that I might not be scared of you. You know, I must stay away from that person. It's not saying that. It's that in knowledge, you are not greater than God. You are not greater than God. The whole papaship doctrine and whatnot, it falls apart. This idea of people thinking, you might scare me in the physical, but I know, believe, you are not the one that I fear. You know, the Bible says, uh, fear him who can condemn both uh, soul and body in hell. And so I'm very clear on that. Whom shall I fear? Uh, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. And in whom shall, whom shall I be afraid of? So you can see right there, my fear is in God. My uh, surrender is in God. Okay? Because I'm at, the mercy, I'm, I'm at your mercy because you have a gun. It doesn't mean that I'm afraid of you. In knowledge, I know God is greater. The famous verse in Psalms is one, uh, 116, right? Uh, the, I love the Lord basically is kind of like the theme line of what you see there. So basically it starts like this. I love the Lord for, the, for he hears my voice. He says, and he my and he had my and heard my cry for mercy so recognizing uh, recognizing his his hand uh, over my life because he turned his ear to me and i will call on him as long as i live and so they love this verse to imply to those that have believed in thingy as a remembrance of what this person believed and if they've cried to the lord then they are submitted unto him. And with him will they reside as the earlier verse that we're thinking. Now, the next verse as well, it says, The cords of death entangled me, uh, and the anguish of the grave came over me. And so right there, I might be overcome by death, okay, when I succumb to its circumstances and so forth. But I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I... Uh, called on the name of the Lord to save me. Okay? And the Lord saved me. It says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. And the Lord protected uh, the unwary. Uh, when I was brought low, he saved me. Now, in this particular verse, we may look at the present state of difficulty and say, But that doesn't align. But remember, in the state in which he is talking, he's talking about salvation. God saved me at the lowest point of where life could have put me, which was what? As a sinful man, detached and far away from God. Okay? The Bible says it is appointed for men to live once, but after that it is judgment. So we are very clear there in that particular establishment that when we are no longer in the present state, we are with God. So what is it that salvation came to accomplish? It came to take us when we find ourselves at the crossroad of death. We are now in the presence of the Most High. That's what salvation was for. Yes, it's not saying that after that day you're going to be like this. Some people just don't even make that transition. They should, but they might not do that. Okay, Salvation was to accomplish relationship back with God. Discipleship is what a person becomes after they born again. And you see that in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto. So the unto implies one is now saved. And where did they get saved? Same chapter. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 and 9. But by grace are we saved that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Okay? 
And so the gift being handed over by what? By confession and seeing the recognition for his thing. So when he started the chapter, you revered, I heard, I, I love the Lord and I heard for he heard my voice. When I come to salvation, I make a cry of his innocence and my guilt. I am guilty of my sin and the Messiah comes to save me from my sin. And saving me from my sin implies reconciling me back to the cross. You can check our live streams on this particular subject and we explain it even further. So when he says the cause of death entangled me and the anguish of the grave overcome me, and that's going to happen. We all know we're going that way, right? Which is why when we spoke about uh, the supposed prophecies that were coming up, we explained this part. It's not so important that a person is going to die. The most important thing is that they are with the Messiah. It's a painful experience for all of us that are here that know the person and so forth, okay? I might not necessarily be bo uh, 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 crying and whatnot and stuff like that uh, in a state of mourning with the family, okay? Because I didn't know him like that, right? I wouldn't take that from you. I wouldn't steal that from you and imply an emotion that I don't uh, exactly exhibit, right? In truth, I am there to comfort and speak of what lies ahead. If one was down here, saved, received the gift of salvation, they, are, they may be overcome and entangled by the stripes of death, which is what marks all humans, right? But when we get over there, on the other side, he is the one that's in charge of us. And so this verse also, oh yeah. Before I skip it, there's this part here. It says, the Lord is gracious and righteous, and our Lord is full of compassion. He says, the Lord protects us unwary, uh, and, and the, the unwary. He says, when I was brought low, he saved me. Listen to this verse. That's where I stopped. He says, return to your rest, my soul, and the Lord has been good to you. So right there, you can see there was distress when I was in this present life, but look at how it ends it. Return to your rest, which implies reconciliation with God. And so when we go from here, we go into that. And I thought that was such an interesting one that this is one of the verses that pastors use when, we, when, they, when a person passes over, right? Now, there's also another verse that is very key. It's John chapter number 14. Johanna 14, you know, we, we, say, we sing that song uh, in reference to cabbage. If you're black, you know what I'm talking about. If you're black in South Africa, you know what I mean. Joanna 14 uh, is the worry not, do not be troubled, right? It says, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, that's going to happen, right? But don't let it drag. I always say this. Uh, you might have heard me talking about parenting and stuff like that. You say, take care of yourself. You know, during the teenage years of your child, you might incur, incur a lot of uh, harm towards your health because you don't, Give yourself rest. When this kid is out there doing whatnot, yes, you're correcting them and everything, and they're doing all kinds of things, you might incur a lot of harm to your health because you don't know how to put yourself at rest. Right? So there you go. You have a verse that literally says that. Do not let your heart be troubled. He's talking about continuous, right? You believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus. My Father's house has many rooms. Okay, if it was not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also and I will come back and take you to be with me. So right there, uh, he's talking about the rapture when the rapture happens and he comes and he takes his church. But also in death, we are delivered up to God. Remember when Lazarus and, uh, and the rich man's story happens, you see Lazarus comes is fetched by the angels to be delivered back unto God. And so that's what happens when we are no longer here. Where is AKA? When you're no longer here, you are either with the Messiah or it's otherwise. If the person is delivered unto God or if the person is saved, this is what, they ha this is what happens. Okay, so it, he comes back to fetch us. So we are not in the grave. The body is in the grave, but we are not in the grave. We are delivered to be with him. And so that's what you note there, and that's what you kind of take from it. Okay, so do not let your heart be troubled knowing that when they are no longer here with us in the physical, they are no longer here for us to have dinner, breakfast with them. Guess what? 
they have been delivered up unto God. And so that's such a very um, wonderful thought to have or to be reminded of. Uh, Isaiah 57 also is one of those, verse 1 and 2 as well. It says the righteous perish, but uh, no one takes it to heart and devour, uh, and devote uh, on the devout are taken away and no one understands. It says the righteous are taken away and to be spared from the evil. That also speaks of what you see with uh, the rapture. We are now taken to be with God before the evil befalls this thing, before this earth, right? And when we are saved, we are taken from the evil, right? And that's what you see over there. And it says they enter into a place of peace. So in in passing, we go on to be with God. Even Paul speaks about that. He says to be here alive, it's beneficial to you. But when I am gone, I am with God. He makes that particular assertion over there. Matthew 23, 23 is also a very popular verse. Okay. He says, and his master is speaking about the servants over here. He says, his master replied, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Remember the parable where they were given something to manage? Uh, and your life is something that you are managing and working with. And at the end of it, the master came back to reward them. One had hidden his talent and so forth. Yeah. But there was one who was faithful. Notice what he, it says. It says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the few things that you were given. Your life, your wealth, um, your health. What did you do with that? Were you, are they just telling everybody that, uh, yeah, me, I'm healthy because God which is a lie. We are we are healthy because uh, because of the genes that we have. There are people that are sick, uh, and it doesn't mean that they are cursed. It's not a curse. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of people see it. It's not the case. We are made to manage what we have. You see, Lazarus, he's sick, but he received the kingdom. It's not that being sick was thinking. You understand? It says, "And I will put you in charge of many things." That's the thousand-year millennia that we spoke about. He says, "Come and share with your master's happiness or in your master's kingdom." Okay, there is a reward that is given to one. So, not in the grave, but gone to receive reward. Now, you may notice also something about this particular verse here, uh, which is Matthew twenty-three, twenty-three, when it ends there. I will, uh, I will put you in charge of many things, which is the millennia kingdom, right? Come and share in with your master's happiness. And so right there, uh, it tells you of two different rewards right there. Come and re receive a reward for your particular work that you've done down here. Two different rewards. There is the reward that is given by the Messiah. There's the reward that is given by God. Okay. And there is the, the reward that is given by the Messiah. You see it in Matthew, in First Corinthians chapter number 3, is to believers. They are rewarded for their good work. Good works don't save. Good works are rewarded in the Bible. Okay? Yes. Now, heaven is not a reward. Heaven is a gift. Okay? Let's be very clear on that. But in Revelation chapter number 20, 21, you see that God rewards the ungodly or people that are not saved with the reward for what their lives was when they're down here. And so where was he or where is he? There you go. Not in there, in the grave, okay? To be raised up one day, or either by the Messiah or when God wakes the world to judgment. I don't know what he believed, uh, by the way. And therefore you will have a, 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 another verse which is very important, which a lot of people love, to read at the funeral, which is Ecclesiastic chapter number 3, verse 1 up until 4. Okay? There is a time for everything, and an activity, and under the sun for everything. It says a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. And a time... And it's, it's funny that he compares killing to healing. Uh, but anyways... That's a different thought altogether. A time to weep and a time to laugh and a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, in this particular situation, it kind of brings up the video that I saw. I saw one video of the family dancing to some music that was playing. I didn't hear what music it was. The video was kind of just scrolling and it started playing like automatically. I didn't even hear what music it was. And so there's a time for all things. There's a time for mourning and there's a time to celebrate a person's life. 
and so forth and so when time to receive the reward from god comes it's upon us okay for some people it will come early for some people it will come a little bit late for some people it might look a little bit delayed but this is important to see why so that a person understands that when you are shoveling the grave they are not in there they are no longer in there they have gone on to be with god or they've they have gone to rest and awoken it or resurrected towards judgment okay whether you believe that a person is in sleep after they die or they are in hell or they are in heaven that's neither here not yet the point of the matter is that they are not here in the grave they are not in that grave they have gone on to receive a reward for what their life was back down here and that becomes very important for people to know to understand to heal because the more we think about that side of bearing them or the, the higher value you have for the, the how the entire burial uh, process will go out uh, whether it be you put uh, as much luxury on it or whatnot just remember that not in there they have gone on to receive a reward a lot of people think that uh, they are in there and so they put so much prize on that reward the person down here when they're still alive you know be appreciative of having to spend five minutes with someone yeah you'll never you you you'll not regret it feel like you have to do something like that okay now of course Kenan was very uh, was a wealthy man and so i can understand the family being able to do that right uh, but at the same time, let's understand they is not not in the grave. They have gone on, of the translated on, to receive reward. That explains why people burning, people that burn to ashes in, in a car accident or whatever, and all that kind of stuff. It explains when you are burying and you don't have the body, they are not in there. They were never in there. Okay, when they died and you're seeing the ashes, they're not in the ashes. They have gone on to receive reward. That's kind of an interesting one and I wanted to put it out here. Uh, for those people that are, that are in mourning, just stating that it's such an, interest, uh, uh, an interesting thought. It helps people to heal. I've seen it before. Because there is, uh, there is the attachment to the grave that people have. We've seen it with people going back to graves and mourning at the graves and so forth. They become attached to the, to, the, to the grave. But the person is not there. They have gone on. As I've illustrated with all these other verses in Psalms and so forth. He says, when I, when I come back, I'll come back and take you. That you see that also in the Matthew chapter 23 verse that we read. So yeah, I'll tell me what you think. And do add down in the comment section other verses as well. On the pinned comment, which will have other videos. Please add your comments there of verses that also uh, you've seen uh, used at the, at the funeral. That are meant to help people either in their healing or as they are going on with their life to understand what happens when we die. We are not going there in the grave. I'm not there in the grave feeling pain. No, 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 no. I've gone on to be with the, with the Messiah, me as a believer. Yes, yes. If you've never believed, you've been down here bashing him. You've been out here saying all kinds of things about God. There is that reward you're going to collect, right? Yes, but... You've been down here mocking him and doing all kinds of things. Yeah, you have that to answer to. You have that to answer to when you cross over. As a person who's a believer, whether I was a minister or you're not a minister or I'm a believer, I believed in the work of the cross. When I die, I'm over there. It's tricky. And I thought that was an interesting one to add the verses down there for the others that are in mourning also. It might help getting them through. So again, I'll see you later. Yeah, be good. Subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of commentary. We do this on a daily basis. And yeah, have a good one.